I always enjoy reading what the Apostle Paul writes to his son in the faith, Timothy. Older preacher writing to a younger preacher. Older Christian writing to a younger Christian. There's always a lot of practical advice. Always a lot of wisdom. And so as we really kind of get to overhear a conversation, we get to kind of cheat and look, read someone else's mail. It's not really so, just someone else's mail, though. Because God saw fit to have it in our Bible. God wanted us to read Timothy's mail. Look how the chapter starts. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call unto remembrance the unfeigned faith that, was, that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, and thy mother Eunice, and I persuaded that is in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. We'll stop right there. I'll tell you what's missing in the lives of a lot of believers today is power, love, and a sound mind. Amen. And what's replaced it is a spirit of fear. You didn't get that from God. Hey, that fear you have, it's not from God. That fear about whether or not your prayers will really get through, that's not from God. Amen. That fear about whether or not you'd really be able to understand the Bible if you read it, not from God. Great. That fear about telling somebody about Jesus and whether or not they'd still be your friend or uh, whether, whether they'd kick you out of your family. It's not from God. Right. If you would allow God, He'd replace that fear. And He'd replace it with power, Amen. love, and a sound mind. Amen. What it's going to take is what I'm preaching on today. Unfeigned faith. Father, we love you. Lord, we come today on purpose. We couldn't make any of these folks show up. Some of them had a struggle just to get here. Some of them had a struggle with the flesh. Some of them had a struggle with their emotions. Some had to struggle with family members. Might have had a struggle with a cantankerous vehicle. Might have had to struggle with traffic. Struggle with the cold. For some, it just wasn't easy. For some, it just clicked along like it was nothing. But for some, it was difficult. But Lord, we're here on purpose and for a purpose. And I pray, Father that today would be a profitable day for each of us. I pray that you'd help us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen, you may be seated. <clears throat> I like looking words up just because I like to know what things mean. You can guess sometimes. And the Bible does define things through context. And sometimes when you don't catch it right away and you go to a dictionary and look it up and then you go back and you reread the chapter you go, oh, it was right there. I just missed the context. 
Unfeigned is one of those things. He talks about Timothy having unfeigned faith. And he talks about how his grandmother and his mother had it. And then he says, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. That would be like doubting. Well, unfeigned means no doubt, no hypocrisy, nothing held back. This is the real deal. Not talk about it, but really having it deep down in you. And that's what's needed. Unfeigned. Listen, no hypocrisy, no faking, no fooling. Unfeigned faith is what we need, friends. Amen. See, everybody here claims to have faith when they're on top of the mountain. You don't need faith on top of the mountain. You're on top of the mountain. What you need to do is praise the Lord and get ready to head back down in the valley. I said, but I don't like the valleys. You haven't been in the mountains, have you? I like going to the mountains. I like going to big mountains. We go to the Rockies there in Colorado. We've got our favorite spots that we go up and occasionally you can get up on top of, of a mountain and you'll get so high you'll get above what they call the timber line. And you go, timber, that sounds like a lot of trees. I don't know why they call it the timber line, that's where the trees stop. They should call it the rock line. Because above that nothing grows. Did you hear that? Up on top of the high mountains, nothing grows. That's right. It's neat to go there. You just can't stay there long. Because mm -hmm. nothing grows. Amen. You can't breathe. And you look up and you go, oh, the scenery's beautiful from up here. What are you looking at? The valley. Amen. Valley doesn't always look so pretty when you're in the valley. It, it's always funny, you know, as humans, we're, we're kind of a, a strange lot. We get on top of the mountain and we look down at the valley and admire it. But then when we're down in the valley, we kind of look at the mountain and go, oh man, I wish I could go to the mountain. Yeah. That's why I like going on long driving trips. Like we just have that change of emotions. We, you just drive and drive and drive and all of a sudden, you're like, oh look, there's a mountain. And then you don't just go and drive to a mountain and go straight up. You get closer and closer, you're like, oh, we're almost in the mountain, you're almost in the mountain. And all of a sudden you start driving and you're looping back and forth and you go, man, I just want to get up on the mountain, I just want to get up on the mountain. All of a sudden you come to an edge and you realize you are on the mountain. Right. It won't be long until it's time to come back down. We're an emotional people. When we're down in the valley, when God's working on us, and God's trying to help us, we whine and we cry about it. Oh, why is God doing this for me? Well, if you'd read your Bible, you would know. He's trying to strengthen us and establish us and He's trying to perfect us and He's trying to make us what we should be. We all want to be up on top of the mountain. We, we were going one year, we were taking a group of the teenagers from the church to Yellowstone. And we went and we stayed in one area and we always go in from like the north east corner. And so we go in from the northeast and, and go, go in there and it's a beautiful place, the big valleys and thousands of buffalo and you can see big wolves and uh, moose. Elk, we always see grizzly bears. It's pretty amazing things up there. But this year, in particular, I decided we're going to go come in from the far north side. And we'd never been that way before. That's why I wanted to go that way. And we went up and we went through a pass called Bear Tooth Pass, heading in from the north side. And I did not know it at the time. But Bear Tooth Pass is obviously the highest point ever in the whole history of all of ever. <laughs> we kept driving up and up and up and stuff stopped growing and we just kept going up and up. And I looked up and I saw something moving. I said, is that a goat? No, that is a bus. 
So we kept going up and up until there was no more up to go. And we found a pile of snow about nine feet high. We got out and let the kids play. They were out there for about four or five minutes, all started wheezing because there's no air. We got back in the, in the van and we went around the corner and when we take those kind of trips, uh, we always take a couple of preachers, me and me and at least one other preacher. And and um, that particular year, we had Brother Jose with us and and uh, from Mexico. And so we got out and we uh, the kids didn't get out on this one. And we got out on what I believe is the highest point of the whole thing, amazingly high. And we got out and we walked over to the edge. And as I like to do and stand right on the edge where if you fall, you don't even call 911 by the time they got there, the mountain lion will done eat you. Just just drive away and sad. <laughs> Take a picture for insurance purposes. <laughs> Zoom in, because it's a long way down. So we get out and stand on those things that kind of make your knees kind of wobble. Make your stomach go, hey, don't do that. And, and, and so we get out there and kind of look. And, and, then, and you get there and you kind of go, man, this is great. This is wonderful. And you look around and you go, let's take a couple of pictures. Take a couple of pictures and you're like, what else you want to do? I don't know, let's drive down the other side. See, you go through all this work to get on top of the mountain and you get there and you realize... Take a couple of pictures, but there ain't nothing to do. So we head back down into a valley. The valley's where the green is. The valley's where stuff grows. The valley's where the fertile ground is. The valley's where the ground gets plowed, where the ground gets worked, where the ground gets fertilized. But that's where stuff grows. We need unfeigned faith. We need faith that's not always going, Oh, is this going to happen? Oh, I, I wish I was there. Uh, oh, I wish I was down there. Oh, I wish I was over there. Listen, we just need to be in the center of God's will with His hand on us and just appreciate where we are at any given moment. Now listen, here's a few things that unfeigned faith... That, that falls short of unfeigned faith. Unfeigned faith. It's more than catchphrase theology. Catch, catchphrase theology. That's like, don't judge lest you be judged. If that doesn't make you want to punch somebody in the throat, I don't know what does. <laughs> The Bible tells us that the spiritual shall judge all things, yet be judged of no man. Unfeigned faith is more than church attendance. Did you know that people can come to church all the time? Even like Lee Robertson said, three to thrive, three to thrive. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, three thrive. You can come to church three times a week and still go home and not be the Christian you're supposed to be. Amen. You can go home at night and still have fears and doubts. Church attendance is wonderful, but it's not unfeigned faith. Unfeigned faith is more than the you think it's hot here, wait till you get to hell t shirt. <laughs> Unfeigned faith is more than the what would Jesus do or the not of this world bracelet. Or God help us, the tattoo. Everybody who asks for a not of this world tattoo, I pray that the tattoo artist would mess up and make it say specifically of this world. S-O-T-W. Instead of N-O-T-W. Unfeigned faith is more than a Facebook update. Amen. 
Unfeigned faith is more than just a passing thought about God. <coughs> Unfeigned faith is more than a cross necklace. Especially the one that you wear that's hanging down in your cleavage. Drawing wrong attention to somebody. That's not unfeigned faith. That's right out of the pits of hell. Amen. Unfeigned faith is more than just an excuse for you not to go to work on Sundays. None of those things that I just listed can overcome fear. None of those things will overcome anything. But fear is what is overcoming a lot of God's people today. Fear is what's going to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. God has not called everybody to do the same thing. I know, I remember the night that God called me to preach. Hey, I was down at youth camp, Comfort, Texas, where there is no comfort in late June. And there I was down in Comfort, Texas in June, standing off to the side, and I know for a fact, and listen, I was there as an adult counselor, first time ever at a youth camp, and I remember God calling me to preach. I didn't know what all that would entail. I was getting my brain wrapped around real good being a Sunday school teacher. Then I was just trying my, trying my feet in the water on trying to be a youth camp counselor. But I was in prayer. And that evening as the preacher quit preaching. I'll go you one better. I don't even know who the preacher was or what he preached. But I remember standing there next to my friend Chris, the fireman, the youth group leader. And I remember wiping a tear out of my eyes. I was praying and I just said, Lord, please call somebody to preach tonight. Lord, if you would, call somebody from our church to preach tonight. Mm -hmm. And I began to pray. And within, I mean just almost instantly, it was as if, and I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was as if I heard an audible voice. I want you to preach for me. And it was strange enough. And it was frightening enough. I looked over at my friend Chris. And he was still praying. So I just bowed my head again and said, Lord, that was weird. Would you please call somebody to preach tonight, Lord? Somebody from our group. We brought a big group, Lord. I think that year there were 17 cars in a, in a convoy that went down. Probably 80-something people from our church. With the vans and all. And I heard it again. And I just had to walk forward where the kids were praying. I just knelt down and prayed. And I said, Lord, I don't know what's happening. But I'll pray about doing whatever you want me to do. I went back home and I talked to my wife. Talked to our preacher. And we went forward and we surrendered our lives. Even at that point, I don't think I had unfeigned faith. And my preacher said scary things to me. You know you're going to have to go to Bible college, don't you? That's no kind of thing to say to somebody. So with fear and trembling, I obeyed my pastor. It was probably a couple of years later that I believe I got to the place where I just had that 
Get to that place where you're like, live or die. Man, I'm just going to do what God wants me to do attitude. Amen. So what if you die? God will use somebody else after that. Amen. Hopefully I'll left behind a little bit of a testimony and God can use that too. If not, then I was a loser. And we just keep going. But I'll be a loser in heaven. Fear. Fear of the unknown. Fear of rejection. Fear of humiliation. I'll give you one. Fear of success. Fear of, of doing something big for God. That'll mess you up. That's actually what messed me up a little bit. I had a good job. Hey, for a kid out of South Irving with no college, I had a really good job. And I was moving up. I was, what do the kids say, making bank. We were making really good money. We were finally there with all my overtime and my wife was working and she was making good money. I was making good money. All of a sudden, we were getting in that six-figure area. May not be a big deal for a bunch of y'all, but in 1999, that was a big deal. For a couple of kids, one out of South Irvine, one out of South Grand Prairie. And all of a sudden, you're like, well, Lord, we're making good money. Hey, can't we just be Sunday school teachers and keep give, maybe give more and give more? See, our problem was we thought we were giving a lot. We give more now on a third of the salary is what we was given with three times the salary. And have more. You know, how does that make sense? It don't make sense. But it don't have to make sense. It's by faith. Amen. Unfeigned faith. Unfeigned faith says I'm not going to quit. Unfeigned, unfeigned faith says, hey, there's a giant in front of me and all I got is a stupid sack of rocks, but I don't care. I'd rather die than be like everybody else that runs every time the giant yells. Amen. Unfeigned faith says, hey, I'm just going to keep building the ark even when people are mocking me and my kids. And even though it takes a long, long time. Unfaith faith says, I'm going to help the bad guys that are God's people, even though everybody in my city is waiting to try to kill them. Unfeigned faith says it doesn't matter about the circumstances. It doesn't matter about the consequences. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Fear says, no you won't. Fear says you'll not do it at all. And our problem is, we listen to fear and we deny the faith and the fear is not of God. God didn't give you that spirit of fear. We have to overcome the fear. Timothy had unfeigned faith. He said, Preacher, I just don't think I can do it. Timothy did it. The Apostle Paul knew the difference and he looked at Timothy and said, I believe you have it. And then he even repeated it. He said, like your grandmama and your mama. Hey, and I'm persuaded it's in you. Let me throw this one at you. He didn't say, your daddy. And his daddy. And his daddy. You know, in the Bible, there's not a lot of mention of women unless it's real important. It was real important in Timothy's life. We don't see daddy. We don't see granddaddy. 
And I don't want to read a whole lot about that, into that. I don't know. Hey, they could have been good men that just got killed in a battle somewhere. They could have been sorry drunks laying in a ditch somewhere. We're not told. And I don't want to get in heavy judgment. All I know is this. Timothy obviously did not have the perfect situation. The perfect situation would have been if he had said, that was in thy father's father and also in thy father and I persuaded is also in you. Timothy didn't have the perfect family. But he had unfeigned faith. See, it's real easy for us to blame stuff on our families sometimes. Well, you just don't know how I grew up. Preacher, you just don't know. I don't have the support like other people do. You better find you some. Because God didn't give you the spirit of fear and you'll never succeed with the spirit of fear. Right. Hey, you know what does? You know what did, did does us real good? If there's something lacking in our family, you know where it's never lacking? In our church family. You know, something I learned over the last 20-something years since we've been real serious about studying, God's real smart. He knows everything. He knows the beginning from the end. And He's real good on everything in the middle. And in His great wisdom, He created this thing called a church. He even said Jesus Christ gave Himself for it. I don't know where Timothy's dad and granddad are. I don't know where the people are that are missing in your situation. None of us probably comes from a perfect family. My wife was real close, but she had a brother. <laughs> when you look at Timothy, there's just a hint. Paul didn't run anybody down. He didn't go into what could have been wrong. But what you have is unfeigned. You have a perfect faith from an imperfect family. You have a, an unshakable faith that's from a family that looks like it's been shaken. You have a perfectly strong faith that comes from a family that's been weakened. And yet here's Timothy on the other side. Timothy's not going to live his life in fear. Timothy's going to slide to verse number 5. I want, I want us to read the verses again. Paul says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, so he says, Timothy, I, I remember, I know you have unfeigned faith. He says, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois. Grandma Lois had unfeigned faith. Isn't that good? It's good when grandmas have unshakable faith, that un, no hypocrisy faith, the real deal faith. And thy mother Eunice. Mama had unfeigned faith. Wasn't unshaken mama's faith. Mama wasn't living under no spirit of fear. She had unfeigned faith. And I persuaded that is in thee also. He said, Timothy, I just know you have it. He said, I want to remind you of something, son. Look at verse number six. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of hands. Paul said, I want you to remember something. I've invested in you. I have prayed on you. 
not P-R-E-Y. I have prayed with you, with my hands on you. And then verse number 7. There's a purpose in having the unfeigned faith passed down and even a preacher getting involved in helping this young man. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear. We've dealt with that. But here it is, and here's the three-point outline. But of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know what our families need? is power, love, and sound mind. Our families are weak and anemic spiritually. Our families cannot overcome a crisis. Our families cannot overcome a hardship. Our families often cannot overcome a misunderstanding. Our families cannot overcome a failure. Our families can't overcome pride. Our families can't overcome unforgiveness. Our families can't overcome much. Because we're spending time on the fear side and we need to be on the power side. We need to have the power of God on our lives. And that requires us to fully and completely and un, with no hypocrisy and no doubt, unfeigned faith will help us to have power. If you believe every single word of your Bible, if you believe that God can do anything, if you believe that God loves you, if you believe that God wants the best for you, hey, friend, you'll be not be afraid of anything. You'll have the power to overcome anything. Amen. Our families are lacking love. Our families are full of selfishness. Kids only want to talk to their parents when they got their stinking hands out. And the reason for that is because we've talked to our kids. We didn't want to talk to them. We said, here, just put your hand out and run along. We didn't want to talk to them. So our kids learn not to talk to us. Say amen right there. Our families don't do things in love. We don't spend time together in love. We don't teach one another in love. It seems like everything's a burden. Man, I tell you what, the computer has done one of the most wicked things to our families. It's given play people a place to gripe publicly. Oh, my kid woke up in the middle of the night. Oh, the kids wouldn't get dressed for school. Oh, the traffic was bad. Shut up. In the Hebrew, that's be thou quietest. <laughs> my husband left without saying goodbye on the way to work. My wife's nagging me. The kids wouldn't take a nap. The microwave broke. Learn how to cook. The air conditioner went out in the car. Roll down the windows and thank God you're not walking. I get sick to death of hearing people complain all the time. And you know what happens? When we write something down, it does something. It's like we write it down and do it. You know, I've seen those things where people write down all the problems, they throw them in a fire. That's fine. Just don't write it down and throw it on the internet. Yeah. Because you know what it does? It puts it back inside your heart. When you hit enter, it puts it inside your heart. And you're just a stinking complainer. And you don't love your family so much that you would berate them on the internet. 
I'm not appreciated. Yeah, I wouldn't appreciate it much either, ma'am. Hey, no wonder your wife doesn't appreciate you, sir. You run her down on the internet? You kidding me? I got a size 14 that would help you get your head right. What a joke. Maybe if you spent more time with your family than you did on the internet, they might appreciate you more. Awful quiet up in here, Lighthouse. If you want your family to know that you love them, why don't you just Facebook message them and tell them? Or you could spend time with them and they'd know it. And I know you're busy. Hey, I got busy perfected. Mm -hmm. Ain't helping my family none. Only thing that helps the family is when daddy's in the room. Spending some time. We wonder why our families are so crazy. We don't have a sound mind. We don't think right. We don't think right about things. I was talking to my wife about another family. Not, not gossip, but showing her another family and, and their, their life and how different it was. And I was showing them, showing her through pictures and things how, how their family just operated in a very different way. We have missionaries that operate their families in very different ways than most of the people that live here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And sometimes it's easy to be afraid of that or to think they're weird. Hey, and they might be weird, but it has nothing to do with the way they operate a little differently. And sometimes we can sit in judgment on other people's families and how they operate when our family's not doing well itself. Amen. You know, we need to get a sound mind. We need to think right about things. We need to have, we need to be receiving the right information so that we can think right about things. We have crazy families because we have crazy schedules. Because there's crazy stuff coming on the TV. Because our kids got their earbuds in and they're listening to crazy things they ought not. By the way, that mom and daddy know not of. That's right. uh, we got crazy things because all of our kids pull out their phone and... <laughs> what are you doing? Nothing. And you don't have the password. And you can't go back and check on your kids. And then you wonder why the world got them. Because you spent so much time at work away from your family so that you could afford to buy a bunch of gizmos and gadgets so you could come home and be away from your family. And you opened up every portal from hell to fill your children's minds rather than spending good godly time with your family. And again, I have to preach this partially at myself because I'm busy. I got busy down. Our families don't need busy parents. They just need parents. The Apostle Paul hit on something earlier in the chapter. Go to verse 3. Understand that Paul is a major, major player in Timothy's life. Paul refers to himself as Timothy's father. Not biological, but spiritually. He calls him his son in the faith. How does... And Paul can't be with him. 
But look what Paul accentuates in verse 3. I thank God whom I serve for my forefathers with pure conscience that without ceasing, it means it never stops, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. You know, there's just something about prayer. It's hard to neglect children that you pray for all day and deep into the night. By the way, it's hard to neglect a wife. It's hard to get mad at a wife. It's hard to yell at a wife. It's hard to hit a wife that you're praying for all day and deep into the night. And you let me find out you're putting your hands on your wife and you'll be the one in need of prayer. We be brethren. And brethren can help one another. Iron sharpeneth iron. And my size 14 boot will sharpen something too. You keep your hands where they belong. If you touch your wife, hey, you better do it kindly and lovingly. You say, why do you even talk about that? Because we live in a stupid, wicked world where even Christians beat their wives. Then there's even some messed up places, and I don't know any of it here, but where wives beat their husbands. And either one of them might be beating their kids. That's not of a sound mind. You know what that is? That's people that have fear. People that have bullies or fear people. They're afraid. They're afraid somebody's going to pick on them. They're afraid they're going to lose control. Daddies that come in. Daddies that come in and beat their family. They're just afraid they're going to lose control. They're afraid somebody's going to do something without them. They're afraid somebody's not going to obey them. So you missed out on the power and love part. Power's not being stronger than somebody else. Power's just knowing where to plug into to get the power to do everything you need to do. Hey friend, there's a lot of families today that are hurting. Maybe, maybe your family's hurting. You know what you need to do? Spend some time in prayer. Get out of the fear side and get over to the power, love, sound mind side. Fear side's not from God. That's a, that's a message from hell. That's an emotion from hell. He said, our family's doing real good. You know what you ought to do then? Hey, man, I'm glad your family's doing great. You ought to spend some time in prayer that it stays that way. Amen. This is the first Sunday of the new year. I'm encouraging families to pray together this year. You can, and I think we ought to pray for each other. I mean, I know what my wife's doing. She's homeschooling kids and doing laundry for six and making meals and couponing and, and doing all this other stuff. And she still helps here at the church. And I pray for my wife all day. Sometimes I pray, for, and I know sometimes I irritate her because I call her a lot. But I'll just be praying, 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 and all of a sudden I'll be like, doo -doo. Hey, how's it going? She's like, fine. So what you doing? Homeschool, laundry, doing stuff. She's like, what do you need? Nothing. Okay, got to go. <laughs> all right, love you. I just, that prayer makes you want to check. When was the last time you wanted to check? I'm encouraging our families to pray together. Oh, you could wait till tonight if you wanted to. Or in a moment. During the invitation time. You could just bring your family down over here, over here. Or gather up right there at the pew where you're at. And just pray together for each other. I know it won't hurt. And it just might help. 
might help a lot. Hey, Daddy, it might help Mama's fears that you didn't know she had. It might help the kids' fears. Hey, family, it might help Daddy's fears. If we just gathered together, here, there, just had a moment of prayer. Not the only one for the year, but a good start for the year. God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. We just need to figure out where we've been getting what we're getting. Match it up with the Word.